think we're hitting a mass threshold here. So this is great. I think we should get started so that there's plenty of time for you guys to go through your education pieces and uh, for questions as well. So welcome everyone this evening. Uh, my name is Beverly Chang. I am an assistant professor at Wild Cornell and one of the co-founders along with Dr. Jamie Kane uh, of the Tri-State Obesity Society, which as many of you probably already know is a nonprofit professional organization dedicated to education and networking for obesity medicine physicians or really anyone interested in obesity medicine. I want to remind everyone that this webinar is recorded. It's also accredited and available for both CME and MOC credits. So if you did not purchase any credit at the beginning but are still interested, just message me through the TRIOS website uh, through the Contact Us link. I do want to introduce briefly our guests tonight, Dr. Jamie Kane, Dr. Doug Lambert, and Dr. Jennifer Rajkumar. They are assistant professors at Northwell Health and dual boarded in uh, internal medicine and obesity medicine. In the interest of time, I cannot go through their very impressive CVs, but I absolutely direct those interested in their stories to please check them out on our Tri-State Obesity website, tristateobesitysociety.org. So I'm gonna let you guys uh, go ahead and share your screen. Right, sorry, give me a second. Uh, <laughs> Are we good on my side? You're looking great. And I wanna remind everyone that if you do have any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, during the presentation and we can address them at the end of the event. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started. Um, so my name is Jamie Kane. I'm the chief of the section of obesity medicine at Northwell um, and the director of the Center for Weight Management. Uh, and along with my colleagues, uh, Doug Lambert and Jennifer Rajkumar will be doing our best to go through obesity nutrition today. Um, just I mean, briefly, we have uh, kind of two different arms. There's the clinical arm to what we do at Northwell, which is the Center for Weight Management. Um, there are, um, I'll go back. There are, um, sorry, ah, ah there we have, uh, <laughs> there are um, eight clinical sites that are up and running all throughout Northwell's vast system uh, in the New York City area. We have seven um, adult obesity medicine specialists and one uh, pediatric specialist, um, in addition to uh, two uh, clinical and research fellows. Um, and we also have in our team nutritionists, uh, a psychologist, um, and a vast network of uh, bariatric surgeons uh, with whom we work. Uh, and uh, just recently, we are now getting into observational and clinical research as well. Uh, I don't have any disclosures, uh, nor does anyone else here. Uh, we all work pretty hard to avoid having um, any conflicts of interest. So um, just a word about nutrition. Um, it's interesting. I, I appreciate uh, Beverly and, the, and the, the board for asking me to put together a team uh, to discuss nutrition for our kind of core curriculum. Um, I, I think uh, as we are known as an institution, um, our Center for Weight Management, we really focus a lot on nutrition. All of our physicians are well-versed on nutrition and we spend the lion's share of our time with patients, whether they end up having surgery or medications or some other um, form of treatment, um, speaking about nutrition with our patients. And nonetheless, I find it to be a very flawed topic. Um, the research behind nutrition is kind of all over the place. It is difficult to, um, to operate in the same manner um, with which science is generally tested um, in, in the modern world. Um, there's a tendency towards reductionistic thinking, which just doesn't apply to nutrition given how complicated the, the human system is. It's also expensive and not money-making. Um, and so the number of very large scale, well-run prospective clinical trials that, that uh, we would like to refer to today are probably gonna be relatively limited. Um, and 
though we constantly talk about this and constantly are researching what's out there, the thoughts end up being a kind of constellation of um, those uh, trials that do exist and, and the few of those that are done well um, mixed with epidemiology, um, animal models and knowledge of uh, human physiology and pathophysiology, uh, putting it all together to, to make the most sense we can out of the topic. Um, but in spite of the flaws, we know that it is, it is the single most important aspect to, to uh, the cause and, and management of obesity. So um, let me kind of get started here. Um, the, I used to show like all the different year by year by year slides, but this is just a kind of graphic from the CDC about obesity. I don't have to convince this crowd um, how big a deal uh, this is. Um, the real curve and color changes would have really started back in the 1970s. And I'll get to that in a second, but we see even now how there's that pocket of most of America outside of the, the real liberal states uh, where everyone's over 30% obesity. And the number's over 70% if you look at overweight plus obesity plus normal weight obesity, right? And so the question is what's been going on and how is this happening, right? Um, and I don't have to convince everyone here that every organ system is affected and that, and that this is a really big, big deal in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality, healthcare costs and so forth. But the reason I show this picture is that we remember why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and it's not just about weight loss, all right? So what, what has happened here, right? So uh, when I was training at Yale, uh, one of the professors there, David Katz, would talk about a, the polar bear as being the perfectly evolved animal, right? So we have this, this enormous animal with this the thick black tarry non-porous skin that allows all the heat to be retained and the big fluffy white fur that keeps it warm and hides it from its prey um, and allows it year round to, uh, to survive under some of the most in, in, inhumane uh, conditions that exist. But you put that same evolved, perfectly evolved animal in the desert and it dies quickly, right? It sticks out like a sore thumb it has uh, no ability to release the heat it needs to in these conditions. There's no water for it. Um, where, and, um, uh, and so it will not be able to uh, continually adapt rapidly. Uh, and we as humans have been stuck in that same situation. We were evolved mainly to prevent, uh, to live until reproduction and prevent starvation, right? Um, and now we're trying to live you know, two, three times that length of time under uh, conditions of, uh, of vast uh, calories, right? And so what's gone on since the 1970s I was talking about? Well, we can look at it from um, the concept of capitalism, right? So this is a graphic that looks at how many calories were available uh, per capita for consumption from 1970 to 2008. We see a, about a 25%, almost 25% increase in the available calories. Um, and of course the driving force has been for, to get people to eat these calories. So if we evolve to uh, prevent starvation and grab all the calories and, and uh, protect all the calories that we can in our body, um, presenting humans with 20 to 25% more calories right off the bat, that should just, just be enough to explain it, right? And then we see the social driving forces, the economic driving forces, and the physiologic driving forces that would make this happen. Um, so quite simply, let's just go back to Weight Watchers 1988, right? I mean, eat, eat less, exercise more, and it does work, right? Low calorie diets uh, do work for a time, right? But the problem is that 97 to 90, I wrote 80, but it's more studies have shown more like 97 to 99% of people will experience recidivism within three years. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but it means that just the notion of looking at it from a simple calorie balance standpoint over the short term and looking at what weight is lost in the short term probably is not enough for us to, to um, sufficiently treat our patients for the long term, which is really why we care about this. Remember all the morbidity and mortality associated with it. Um, I'm not gonna go through this chart other than to say that the control of, of food regulation is complicated. And so, um, uh, this has been hijacked by our, the presence of excess calories and by the presence of lots of refined and addictive foods. Um, and so we must play with this in order to make, make the system work, right? So what are some of the causes uh, that, that 
supersede or at least uh, contribute beyond plain having a positive calorie balance uh, to obesity. Um, the insulin resistance I wrote, it's actually, the data is probably stronger on hyperinsulinemia rather than insulin resistance. Um, there are definitely a mouse model that was pretty impressive where one of the two uh, insulin genes was knocked out. And no matter how much you overfed the mice, uh, a high fat diet, which, which is easily causes uh, obesity in mice, um, you could not generate obesity. Um, inflammation, oxidative stress, the same thing. By blocking those pathways, you can prevent the formation of obesity. And then uh, dysbiosis uh, is, seems to be relatively common um, and we'll be getting into some of those arenas. Um, uh, uh, one note about the insulin. Um, so people have taken this concept uh, a long time ago and, and tried to solve the problem by avoiding foods that cause short-term spikes of insulin. But when we talk about insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, it's not what happens when you eat brown rice. It's more of the chronic elevated insulin and inappropriate responses to insulinogenic foods. All right. So um, the last thing I just want to mention is, is kind of the concept of weight loss versus obesity medicine. And for those of you who are like really young, maybe you've, you've already just fallen into the world of obesity medicine, but this was not that long ago, the bariatric medicine was the term. Um, and the reason I like the change is because the, the concept of obesity medicine means treating patients with obesity um, as if it's a chronic disease and, and something that has to be factored in over, over a lifetime. Whereas uh, looking at short-term weight loss um, without regard to long-term morbidity and mortality, um, lifespan and health span um, really isn't, at least where we're working, we're not, we're not trying to think about them as separate issues. Um, and it's in that context uh, along with the other stuff I've already mentioned that, that uh, my team is going to um, going to uh, go through uh, the basics of nutrition. All right. So um, uh, someone probably should mute their, their screen if they have it on. Sorry, uh, it's repeating. So uh, Doug will start by talking about uh, Paleolithic human diets as far as we know them, just so we get a start of kind of where, where this all came from what the various guidelines go through um, and then compare energy restricted diets. Remember all low calorie diets are associated with weight loss for some time compared to various forms of ad libitum diets uh, that might produce the same or better long-term results. And then we'll talk about a couple of the hotter issues of ketogenic diets and, and very low calorie, uh, very low carbohydrate diets and, and the gut microbiome. Um, and then hopefully we'll leave some time for some questions. All right, so uh, Doug, thank you very much. Okay, um, thanks, Jamie. Um, so I'll very briefly talk about how we ate um, as Stone Age humans, because I do think it has some bearing on uh, how we manage weight and how we help people lose weight. Um, next slide. Um, so my goals are just to, you know, in my part of the talk, just recognize some basics of sort of how we ate and how it's different. Um, you know, I'm going to make one large point about energy restricted diets and then really go through ad libitum diets in quite a bit of detail. Next slide. So, you know, our, when I talk about um, Stone Age humans, you know, we've been around for, um, as, you know, in some form for two and a half million years, but our genes were really heavily selected for in the last 40 to 50,000 years. And so how we lived at that time really does say a bit about how we should be eating. Um, and for starters, we ate an awful lot of plants, uh, that's for sure. Um, some estimates are over 50, over 100 grams of fiber per day. Um, you compare that to what the ADA recommends and what the average American eats, it's really not even close. Next slide. Um, and the other thing is that the, the fruits and vegetables and, and plants we had access to were wild. And uh, there have been analyses of differences between agriculturally produced things and then stuff in the wild. And it's quite a bit of difference in terms of fiber content. We've actually cultivated food to have less fiber because it's, uh, it's easier to eat and et cetera. Next slide. Uh, we also know from fossil records that we did, in fact, eat grains and we cooked them and we ate tubers. We actually processed food to some extent. Next slide. Uh, just an example, there is a modern hunter-gatherer group in Africa, the Bushmen of the Kalahari, who uh, get uh, almost 70% of their diet from plants. And um, most of that is actually from nuts uh, from the Mangongo tree. Next slide. 
However, it's without question, we ate a good amount of animal um, substance as well. Uh, the estimates are very widely um, and are somewhat controversial because they were based on uh, ethnographic data. Um, but the work of S. Boyd Eaton and um, Lauren Cordain is very interesting. I encourage you all to read it. Um, but anyway, it's, it's true that we eat um, quite a lot and quite a, quite a big range depending on the latitude. Next slide. So uh, we actually primarily ate um, mammals. Uh, and so this was in East Africa. However, we did not just only eat muscle. We ate uh, the marrow, the brain, uh, actually an awful lot of fat. So it was actually a relatively high fat diet, more moderate in protein. Next slide. However, this is a key difference. Something I want to emphasize is the fat composition of, uh, of what we were eating was quite different. So the fat content of wild animals is really much closer to the fat content of plants and, and of nuts and things like that. So it's a, a, a low omega-6 to 3 ratio, um, really unsaturated. Next slide. And this is just a slide to show you when you compare grain-fed steer to, to either grass-fed or wild animals, the saturated fat content of, of, of lean appearing muscle, this is trimmed steaks, is um, over, twice as, over twice as high. So uh, not only, um, so what we're eating in the modern era is actually much lower quality in terms of saturated fat. Next slide. And the final difference is activity. There's no question that we uh, moved a lot. We were very muscular. So any attempt to sort of recapitulate the paleo diet in the modern form uh, must take into account this fact. And I, uh, uh, it's, it's really important to, to realize we were born to move. Um, next slide. So the bottom line is we had a lot more fiber, the fat profile was different and we moved uh, in a way that we cannot possibly recreate in the modern environment. And so what are we to do with this, this you know, these differences? And so I'm gonna go into that now. Next slide. So this, you know, we all know that we overeat sugar and processed food. This slide is um, from one of Cordain's studies and it just tracks how fat consumption and saturated fat consumption has, has actually been increasing over the past uh, century. Next slide. So what are our guidelines? Um, next slide. So I'm actually gonna start with the European Society of Cardiologists. Um, so this just came out. Um, this um, guideline I think is important because it's very recent and takes into account new evidence. And you know it does recommend eating more plant-based, less animal food, less saturated fat, more fiber, more fruits, nuts, fish over meat. And I do think that echoes sort of what we know about um, the nutrition of our ancestors. Next slide. But then what do we prescribe in terms of weight loss? So really there's, there's two routes we can go. We can create an energy deficit by prescribing that deficit, perhaps by providing foods, um, or we can sort of play with the macronutrients. Um, and those two approaches are really the, the main roads you can go down. Next slide. So that's what the OMA says, but the um, AAC CPG from 2016 basically says the same thing. Energy restriction, or you can alter macronutrients to reach your goal. Next slide. So again, these are the two roads. And I'm first gonna talk about energy restriction. Next slide. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna to touch upon some of the major studies. So um, Saxon Bray's study um, in the New England Journal from quite a few years back um, basically showed us uh, when you create a caloric deficit, regardless of whether it's high fat or um, low fat, high protein, low protein, or regardless of the carbohydrate content, at 12 months, uh, weight loss and fat loss was equivalent. It was notable, however, that the high fat diet was associated with greater fat free mass loss. Next slide. Uh, in the calorie study by DOS, um, the, another energy restricted diet. This one focused on um, uh, high glycemic load, sort of traditional low fat versus a low glycemic index index high protein and basically showed equivalent weight loss at both six and 12 months. And notably it was actually activity in that protein content that determined the rate of fat-free mass loss. Next slide. And finally, the work of Lucombe, Marsh, Noakes, and Keogh. Uh, they worked out of New Zealand and they basically confirmed all of these findings as well. They did a number of studies. Excuse me, next slide. So uh, the bottom line is that when you're restricting energy, uh, macronutrient composition is not important. It's probably important still to reduce fat, 
um, but it should be tailored to the patient and uh, emphasize healthy fats, um, you know, as, as part of the diet rather than saturated fat. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk quite a bit about ad libitum diets. Um, so I'm gonna start with sort of the traditional low fat diet, what that looks like. Next slide. So you know, a classic example is the Ornish diet. So Dean Ornish did research in the, you know, in the 90s, a few very famous studies, and his diet is a lacto over vegetarian diet. It's vegan leaning. Um, it did sometimes have some processed food components to it. It allowed for some bread and pasta. Um, it allowed egg whites as well as some dairy. Next slide. And of course, another example is the what what the ADA basically recommends, which is to stick with lean protein. Uh, focus on the creating a balanced meal uh, without necessarily specific macronutrient compositional recommendations. Next slide. And finally, there, there's a classic uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes diet, which was what the National Cholesterol Education Program recommended um, in response to their very famous report in the early 2000s. Um, so this was actually a higher fat diet, but it focused on um, healthier fats and really eliminating cholesterol and saturated fat. Next slide. So what do we know about these traditional low fat diets? Well, there, there were a number of really well-designed studies, really nicely controlled. And this study by Skav and Astrup, this was out of Denmark. So th th this was a group of patients randomized to either a sort of traditional low fat diet, which included more processed foods, or a sort of high protein diet. And you can see the weight loss trajectory. And, and they were actually given these foods, provided them. So it was very carefully controlled. And what you can see is that the closed circles with the higher protein relative to the more processed carbohydrate diet had better weight loss, uh, although it was no longer significant at 12 months. Next slide. Um, McMillan Price's um, work, um, I think this was in JAMA, um, showed, sorry, this was in Annals of Natural Medicine. Um, had a really important finding, and that was when you actually controlled for the glycemic index of the diet, protein didn't seem to matter. Um, so it seemed to be that it really, it's the, it's the sort of quality of the carbohydrate. When you actually have a lower glycemic index, the weight loss was equivalent. And in fact, the LDL um, actually increased when the patients were on the high protein diet. So their conclusion was cardiovascular disease risk reduction uh, is optimized with the high carbohydrate, low glycemic index diet. Next slide. And then a couple of really um, high profile studies came out comparing um, popular you know, weight loss diets. So Danziger's study in 2005 looked at Atkins versus Zone versus Ornish versus Weight Watchers. It was a very pragmatic trial. It wasn't a very intensive intervention. And really at 12 months, it showed that all the diets were very similar, not much difference. And in fact, weight loss was associated with adherence, which is not surprising. Next slide. Next one, Jim. And then Gardner had a follow-up study also in JAMA, uh, the A disease study. And this was more intensive and actually showed uh, better weight loss with the Atkins diet versus the others. Next slide. So, you know, the bottom line with ad libitum traditional low fat diets, it seems that it you know, they do work. And, and uh, you know, if they're very carefully controlled, you can have pretty good weight loss, but generally it's more modest without other things added to it. Uh, it's generally advisable to increase protein and increase fiber, although when you take into account the glycemic index, that matters less. Um, obviously, counseling and, and uh, patient attention is, is, is needed to optimize adherence. Next slide, please. So, you know, at this point, I do want to just have a comment about processed foods. Next slide. So uh, if, if anyone here has ever read the work of Kevin uh, Hall, I, I, um, if anyone has him, I highly recommend it. He is uh, a really brilliant researcher who works at the NIH. Um, he's a physicist by training, and he's done some really, really amazing diet studies that, have, that really teach us a lot about diet composition. And one thing he showed was in a two-week by two-week randomized crossover trial, with the only variable being the degree of how processed the food was, um, it really had some interesting findings. And the macronutrient composition of the diets was absolutely identical. I think there was a little bit of sugar in the, a little bit of greater sucrose in the processed diet, but otherwise it was, a, it was equivalent. Next slide. So what he showed was that um, when patients went on the processed food diet, they gained weight during the entire part of that intervention. When they switched back over to the unprocessed diet, 
they started to lose weight. And these were fat mass changes. So even when uh, the macronutrient composition of the diet was exactly the same, it turned out that it was processed food versus unprocessed that made the difference in terms of weight gain. Next slide. So I now wanna to touch upon the DASH and Mediterranean. These are well-known diets. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about them briefly. So DASH is you know, famous dietary pattern for blood pressure control. Um, it's generally low fat, low sugar, has some processed food. It favors um, dairy over animal protein generally, but it does allow for it. Next slide. And what we know is from, from meta-analyses, we know that DASH ad libitum leads to very modest weight loss, really less than a kilogram based on the existing research. Next slide. But of course, when you add something to it, so the premier study that Apple did as a follow-up showed that um, DASH plus either energy restriction, um, energy restriction and exercise compared to DASH alone led to greater weight loss, which is certainly not surprising. Next slide. So the Mediterranean diet, famous from some epidemiology from several decades ago, of course, um, in, in this isn't a low fat diet. This is actually a you know, moderate fat diet. It allows for quite a bit of polyunsaturated fat. And the cardiovascular benefits of the Mediterranean diet are really not questioned, um, especially relative to the Western diet. Next slide. However, ad libitum diets actually, when you really only focus on the studies that only had the Mediterranean diet as the intervention, do not lead to weight loss. So this is really not a, a diet to advise the patients who aren't other taking other measures. Um, of course, when you add energy restriction and physical activity, you do get weight loss. Next slide. So I'm going to talk uh, for a bit about low-fat vegan, also known as whole food plant-based. Next slide. Uh, first, I just want to touch upon some epidemiology that I think teaches us a bit about how dietary patterns impact weight and health. Next slide. So first, I just want to um, mention Okinawa, the um, island uh, off the southern part of Japan. Okinawa is very famous for having um, a very uh, large population of folks who live over 100 years. Uh, and its culture and its diet for a long time was very distinct from that of Japan. Next slide. And so it's a really a high carbohydrate, very vegan leaning diet. The staple food is the sweet potato. Next slide. They eat lots of other very interesting vegetables, very little fish, but, but they do eat fish. And it's 85% carbohydrate and 9% protein and 6% fat. So it's a very unique diet. And when you compare its composition to the modern Okinawan diet or DASH or Mediterranean, it's really quite different. Next slide. And what we know actually is the cohort of patients from this era of uh, the history of Okinawa have some of the best health outcomes in the world. So um, <clears throat> on the far left, those are coronary um, heart disease rates. And those bars actually are only about half the actual height. So those gray bars that are the, that represent the US, those are quite a bit higher actually than either Japan or Okinawa. And on the far right, you have prostate cancer and breast cancer. And the rates are about a fifth in Okinawa versus the US. Next slide. And so these trends are really, these health trends are observed elsewhere too. In Europe, the EPIC study, in the US, the Adventist um, health study too, really shows this gradient where you go from folks who are vegan and sort of add additional components of animal protein sources on top of it, and you go all the way up to non-vegetarians, there's this gradient where as you go up, the BMI goes up and the cardiovascular risk factors go up as well. Next slide. And this is a graph from the EPIC study in Europe. It shows that um, regardless of the age and life, at the bottom of this graph, those are the vegans. At the top are the um, non-vegetarian. And um, again, there is this gradient. So in between, you have vegetarians and pesco-vegetarians. At the top, you have uh, folks who still eat meat. Next slide. And finally, uh, there was a multi-regional study done in the US called the Intermap study not too long ago. And this study in multivariable analysis shows us that, uh, surprisingly, it's not carbohydrates that are associated with BMI. It's actually animal protein and dietary fat. Next slide. Uh, so I'm going to get into the research. Um, so in the 1990s, it was Dean Ornish and John McDougall who, who did a lot of this work very famously. Dean Ornish um, became well known for his study showing that 
uh, a vegetarian diet plus a lifestyle intervention led to coronary artery plaque regression. John McDougall did very interesting studies in patient where he uh, gave patients a very high starch diet and very, very low fat. He didn't cook with any oil, as an example. Um, and patients would do very well. They'd lose a lot of weight and most of it was fat weight. Next slide. Um, and in the modern context, I think it's Neil Barnhart's group that really took this over. So uh, this is a group um, who have done a lot of really amazing work. Uh, and they, their intervention is ad libitum, high carbohydrate, whole food, low fat, vegan diets. And the, the intervention looks like um, usually about two months every week for about an hour. They do a teaching session. They really train patients on how to, how to cook, how to shop, um, and they provide a lot of resources. Next slide. And so what his group has shown is um, th this, this style of diet, whole food vegan diet, is superior to the ADA diet in terms of weight loss at 14 weeks and at two years. Um, it's superior to the AHA diet as well. Um, and surprisingly, compared to the ADA, or perhaps not surprisingly, better glycemic control and better cholesterol improvement. Next slide. Uh, Turner McGreevy. Uh, sort of recapitulated those epidemiology findings in this particular study. And it was a randomized trial. These are all low fat diets, but um, it compared vegan to pesco vegetarian to semi vegetarian to omnivorous. And it really kind of recreated that gradient uh, by showing that weight loss was greatest among the folks who adhere to vegan diets. Next slide. And finally, uh, Kaliova and Barnhart had a couple of recent studies, again, showing very interesting stuff. Uh, Barnhart's study uh, compared this diet to the Mediterranean, actually, and as expected on the Mediterranean, the patients did not lose any weight. Um, and on the low-fat vegan, cholesterol improvements were better, weight loss was greater. However, on the Mediterranean diet, um, blood pressure improvement was actually a bit greater, uh, which, was, which was surprising. Next slide. And this graph shows uh, that particular trial uh, that Barnhart did. So when, so let me orient you here. The weeks are on the y are on the x-axis. The body weight loss on the y-axis. And as you can see, when patients were on the vegan diet, there was consistent weight loss, regardless of when that phase was, either first or second. When they were on the Mediterranean diet, it was re really a, quite a fat uh, flat line. There really wasn't much movement. Next slide. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about ad libitum ketogenic for a moment as well. So the ketogenic diet has been around for much longer than the last 20 years, but it really became, there's a lot more interest in, a lot more interest in it about, uh, starting about 20 years ago. Um, so the ketogenic diet is generally low, very low carbohydrate, less than 50 to 20 grams per day. Um, and some of the early studies compared it to traditional low fat diet that was energy restricted. Um, studies by Yancey, Samaha, and Stern in uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine and in, in the New England Journal uh, showed superior weight loss at six months, but actually not at 12 months. But these studies were interesting enough and really impressive enough that a lot of research happened since. Next slide. So we now have over 17 years of follow-up studies from that time. Um, and you know, as a good entry point into learning about the ketogenic diet, there's a really great review by the National Lipid Association that I think is very even-handed and really goes over the evidence nicely. Um, and really one of the challenges and something to, you know, to consider when you're comparing diets in these studies is, is the, is the ketogenic diet actually ketogenic or is it just a low-carb diet? And that's something really to pay attention to. Um, and that's something they point out as being a shortcoming in some of these studies because it's not really well-defined. Next slide. And what we do know generally is that compared to a traditional low-fat diet, ketogenic really isn't clearly superior, particularly over the long term. Um, there's been a lot of talk about LDL in relation to ketogenic, and I think what we know is that some patients have a very strong reaction to the diet and their LDL spikes. However, um, overall, it does not seem to be too big of an increase on average. Next slide. So some potential benefits though of keto are that HDL generally goes up, triglycerides will go down, and there is a potential reduction in the burden of diabetes medicines. Next slide. Um, however, again, not clearly superior to traditional low fat, the farther out you go. Um, and we do need longer term data because uh, sometimes the ketogenic diet as it's practice has an awful lot of saturated fat and that's certainly concerning if you're uh, worried about lipids and, and cardiovascular disease as well. Next slide. 
Uh, so this, you know, the body of research, I think, does allow us to question this concept that unless you turn off insulin, there's no weight loss. Uh, you know, I think we know from energy restricted diets that the composition doesn't matter and, and that low glycemic index carbohydrates may in fact be helpful. We also know from epidemiology that um, more carbohydrate leaning diets that are low in fat are associated with greater longevity and lower body mass index. And we know from the work of these researchers that low fat whole food plant-based diets really work better than a lot of conventional diets for really important health metrics, including A1C. Um, and so I do want to touch upon a couple of um, studies by Kevin Hall uh, before I turn it over to Jen. So the first uh, was um, another inpatient study. Uh, it was done at the NIH, and it was a seven by seven randomized crossover study, energy restricted diets, and uh, the protein content was the same in these diets. Uh, and the only difference was uh, between fat and carbohydrate. And the expectation was that in the high fat diet, insulin levels would be lower and there would be a greater oxidation of fat and greater fat loss compared to the high carbohydrate diet. Next slide. And really what they showed was the opposite. There was actually greater net fat loss on the high carbohydrate, low fat diet. There was also a positive nitrogen balance on the high carbohydrate diet. So, and the implications of this are that low carbohydrate is not necessary for fat loss, and especially in comparison to high fat. And in fact, high carbohydrate diets may in fact be beneficial for lean mass, and that's actually echoed in the next study as well. Next slide. So Hall's most recent study which came out earlier this year, um, was another inpatient crossover study, 14 days on each diet, and it compared whole, um, whole food, low fat, plant-based diet to ketogenic. Um, and the protein content was the same in both diets. Patients were allowed to eat ad libitum to fullness for, for the full two weeks. And the findings were really very interesting. Next slide. Uh, first of all, um, the idea that if uh, insulin levels are high, you eat more, uh, that was really tested in this study. And in fact, folks on the ketogenic diet ate more calories than those on the low fat uh, vegan diet. Next slide. Uh, during these first two weeks, when folks entered ketosis, there was actually a loss of, um, you know, a good amount of this was water, but there was actually quite a bit of lean mass loss. There was a negative nitrogen balance, and that accounted for almost all of the weight loss in the ketogenic group during those first two weeks. Next slide. And the fat loss was greater in the um, high carbohydrate, low fat vegan diet compared to the ketogenic diet, which did not have a significant weight loss. Next slide. Next slide. So I think we know from um, the research on adolescent diets that, you know, generally more modest um, weight loss is attained when you follow traditional low fat, when you use diets like the DASH diet, or when you just sort of advise patients generally to increase protein or increase fiber without something very specific or, or a bit more um, you know, a bit more involved. Uh, diets that are associated with greater than 5% weight loss, more significant weight loss, uh, tend to be either uh, the whole food, um, low fat vegan diet or the ketogenic diet. Next slide. I think we know pretty conclusively that processed food should be eliminated rather than telling patients not to eat carbohydrates. It's advisable to tell them not to eat processed carbohydrates. Next slide. Uh, and finally, outside of ketogenic diet, I think fat content really does matter for weight loss. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, fat is very calorically dense. It's the most dense of all the macronutrients, and uh, it's very hard to keep track of. And we don't know uh, the fat content of a lot of the food um, you know, that's processed or that we buy uh, you know, from restaurants or, or, or as takeout. Um, so really, all fats should be paid attention to when it comes to ad libitum diets. There's really no advantage unless you are going for ketogenic. Um, but especially saturated fats. I think we know that our exposure to saturated fats is so unbelievably high, uh, you know, in the modern world, and it's just not natural with our biology. Next slide. And again, uh, regardless of the dietary intervention, always important to have really intensive clinician instruction and follow-up. I think um, patients should generally have a lot of dietary advice from their doctors, as well as from nutritionists and other professionals as well. Next slide. Okay. All right. So 
Um, and I'm going to try to do my best to um, make sure that we have time for questions. But the last part um, that I'll be talking about is a gut microbiome. Next slide. Um, we all know uh, the importance of the gut microbiome, and I want to get uh, speak about some um, specific pathways that um, it can be useful for. So uh, most of the bacteria that's been studied um, is in the last is in the colon. Um, so most of the bacteria, um, it, most of the research uh, shows. Um, uh, they take fecal samples of patients and monitor that. Um, and so you'll be, most of it is reflective of the, um, the colon bacteria, but the size of it, the, the weight is two to five pounds, pretty much almost the size, pretty much the size of, um, of our brain. Uh, next slide. So we'll talk, so I'll be talking about function. Um, it had the bacteria and the fungi, protozoa, all the other living things, uh, organisms that are in our gut have um, a multitude of uh, functions, not just breaking down food compounds, absorbing um, vitamins, minerals, but also training and uh, developing and training our immune system, um, uh, affecting fat storage, insulin resistance, um, in addition to the actual uh, quality of the, uh, the barrier. Um, whether it's permeable or not, um, and its resistance to pathogens. Next slide. So the um, we were Jamie earlier was talking about um, capitalism, and I'll go into that a little later. But as far as biodiversity, we've certainly um, uh, as a world decreased our biodiversity of what we are eating, and that directly affects um, the diversity of our gut microbiome. Next slide. And as, as an example of, as some extreme example of um, two populations and their breakdown, so um, the study um, from uh, Simpson et al. from 2015, they, they compared fecal samples between um, children in Burkina Faso, Africa, um, eating more of a plant-based agrarian diet rich in fruit and legumes and fiber um, with European children um, eating a more Western diet, rich, very much rich in animal fat, low, uh, low in fruit, legumes, and dietary fibers. So we look at the uh, top and bottom. Uh, I want to um, alert you to the outer rings, the, the green um, being bacteroides, um, phyla, which is one of the two main phylas, the other being um, firmicutes, and the, um, the red being the ratio of firmicutes. So in the top, we see most of the um, bacteria phyla are in the bacteroides and the and the bottom in the Western diet we see almost practically inverted um, with majority of bacteria being um, acutes and this balance um, is extremely important with different processes um, uh, with end stream effects. Next slide. And so the more so overall um, the more uh, the more bacteria we have, um, the overall, uh, the better that um, our health is, the, the end stream effects, cardiovascular um, stroke, et cetera. Next slide. There, and uh, so as far as genetics, uh, um, there's a study um, in rodents talking about, well, if, if, um, if a rodent is predisposed to obesity, how does it, um, how does it shift in a diet that is uh, low in saturated fat, high in fruits and vegetables? So on the left, um, in blue, you have um, a, a OB OB um, rodent, and the red is a uh, lean, genetically lean rodent. And having a uh, low saturated fat, high fruits and veggies um, diet, there is um, there is weight gain in the obese mice and le and none in the lean mice. And, um, but when they are co-housed, so when we put them together, they're eating each other's stool, sharing bi microbiomes, um, cause that's what rodents do. Um, we have a normalization of that microbiome and um, no significant change in, um, in weight gain. On the right, um, so same thing separately, um, the um, OB, OB, obese mice will gain weight um, and an unhealthy diet and the lean mice less so still do so. Um, but when co-housed, um, having a, a high saturated fat, low um, in fruits and vegetables, low in fiber diet, 
um, there's there's no change, and uh, the uh, obese mice uh, and the obese mice stays obese. Next. Another thing to consider is these bacteria are not only breaking down things, but um, making uh, certain types of metabolites. And two, I'm going to go through, but there are um, a couple others. And those metabolites um, can either be, in general, more helpful or unhelpful. Um, and um, unhelpful meaning oxidative stress, um, uh, production of reactive oxygen species. Next slide. And so one of them is, uh, one of the metabolites is short chain fatty acids. So how does this produce bacteria in the colon, um, more so the bacteroides, uh, the healthier bacteria break down ferment um, fiber and carbohydrates to short chain fatty acids. And those have an improved, um, uh, improve our outcomes in multiple um, body systems, decrease the amount of inflammation um, in our body. Um, and then the sec second half of this image, um, red and processed meats, um, as uh, Dr. Lambert was talking about earlier, sulfur compounds, the uh, changes, the um, nitrogen balance, um, and um, uh, and physical activity. So there's other things that are affecting the short chain fatty acids, physical activity, um, decrease sleep, um, increase stress, um, affect the bacteria, which then affect the amount of short chain fatty acids um, produced. Next slide. And uh, these are, there's multiple processes that I wish I had um, more time to go into specifically how the micro, the uh, microbiome composition affects these different processes, but um, uh, on top you have, um, so you have metabolism, insulin resistance, um, uh, and then feedback to the central nervous system and, um, and liver function. Next slide. The other um, metabolite, the other important metabolite is uh, TMA, which in the presence of uh, breaking down phosphatidylcholine, which you see a lot, uh, which is in high concentrations in um, dairy, so cheese, um, also seafood, um, eggs, um, uh, meats, animal meats, um, normal healthy bacteria will break them down, cause um, secretion of TMA in the portal system. So remember, um, the gut bacteria are secreting all these things in the portal system, then having feedback to the liver, then um, the liver takes um, TMA uh, trimethyl oxide and uh, changes it to TMAO, which then is released into the systemic circulation. And TMAO has, um, has been shown to increase the coagulability of platelets and affecting um, the risk of heart attack, stroke, and um, so atherosclerosis, cholesterol deposits in the arterial walls. Uh, next slide. Also, um, immune system, we, we all know that um, obesity is associated with uh, 13 or more different types of uh, cancers. Um, in this study, um, healthy, healthy human volunteers were given um, about a 100 calorie uh, meal after, uh, after fasting, um, and one being a um, high saturated fat um, uh, um, meal, and you can see even in two to three hours. So what it's um, what they measured is the TLR4 toll-like receptor on immune cells um, that can be um, pro that are pro-inflammatory. So with a chronic low-grade um, inflammation that happens every couple hours. Um, it's kind of like um, you you turn on the oven and the fire alarm keeps on coming, uh, turns on every single time. And um, so with that low grade inflammation, um, the body's defenses against um, foreign invaders and um, uh, cancerous like entities decreases. Next slide. And another um, another pathway for fructose, um, which occurs naturally, of course, in say an apple, but also in high fructose corn syrup and a lot of processed foods. Um, when bacteria break down fructose, they uh, with xanthine oxidase, they they make some uric acid. And more important thing to know is that fiber um, uh, shuts down the xanthine oxidase. So when we have a 
balanced um, whole food um, source of fructose, this is this is not happening. Um, so uric acid is produced, which causes uh, in a in a low um, concentration, which causes inflammation, oxidative stress down the line, and also affects our renin-angiotensin system. Next slide. And uh, so this is a this is a slide that shows all the different again all the different types of ways that our um, microbiome affects endpoints that affect um, the health span of of a human being. So um, just a an important um, so we talked about liver, but also brain how the um, gut and the brain speak uh, directly to each other, whether it's via the vagus nerve or via the portal and, and circulatory system. The gut produces 90, so I've seen 95% of the body's serotonin. Um, and uh, I think that's all I want. Okay, next slide. So this, this dysbiosis, earlier um, talking about the difference between the two populations where there is a um, significant change in the phyla of bacteria that are in our um, that are in our gut. Um, next slide. So, kind of keeping in mind prioritizing as obesity medicine specialists um, an eating plan that promotes healthy absorption, signaling, and barrier quality. In addition to um, getting to a healthier weight. Um, so. Um, we've we've detailed the um, importance of of fiber in that um, the potential harmful um, effects of a high saturated fat um, uh, composition of diets and it it is still possible to for people to lose weight and increase um, or continue to have an increased cardiovascular risk um, and so with that next slide. Um, so some some final thoughts. Uh, since the since 2012, the Human uh, Mic Microbiome Consortium project, where they took uh, samples of like behind the ears and gut and um, vaginal uh, samples, etc., it's it really blew open this field. Um, and evidence is showing an integral role of um, the gut microbiome in metabolism and obesity. And when I when I brought up the uh, the mice uh, showing the diet is the most important element to shape the gut microbiome. Yes, we have a signature at two or three that's associated with um, like vaginal versus C-section and breast versus bottle, et cetera, et cetera. But that is very much um, changeable um, throughout our life. So as specialists um, using nutrition as a basis to shift that gut microbiome, when someone um, is on a, um, on a poor diet, there is a lot more sloughing. So just um, uh, the the membrane is uh, overturning more, and and healthy bacteria just aren't able to survive properly in that environment. Um, so um, taking probiotics is just is not going to hold in that type of environment, uh, that type of hostile environment. Next slide. And then more thoughts going on to um, just what has been happening for the past 100, 150 years. The world's source of food is, is mostly in control of a handful of corporations. We can get the same food every state, sometimes every a um, lot of other countries. Um, and so we've standardized a lot of things. Um, most global animal production, specifically pork production, is based around the genetics of a single breed of pig, not a whole lot of diversity. Um, as far as plants, also uh, very similar um, aspects. There's 1,500 species, uh, varieties of banana, but global trade is mainly based on one, the Cavendish banana. Next slide. So they're all the same genetics. Everyone is a clone of another, and um, which puts them at risk for um, to be wiped out from um, pests or climate change, um, et cetera. Next slide. And there's actually been waves of bananas, a uh, whole species of bananas being wiped out in the 20s, they even made songs about it and posters about it. Um, so the previous species, Gross Michel, um, is pretty much almost wiped out. And now we have the Cavendish and you know, the cycle will, will keep going. But just to show that the, that has been the trend over the past 100 years and kind of gives us some insight as to why, it, um, why, thing, why that is. Uh, next slide. 
So these are our references. You can, you can, you can just go to the end and um, we can take questions. Um, I don't have anything in the chat at the moment, but if you want to stop sharing your screen, we can kind of pull everyone in again. You, you guys should feel free to unmute yourselves or turn on your video and ask questions uh, if you have any. I'll ask a fun question. Um, so what do you guys eat? Are you omnivores? Are you vegan? Are you vegetarian? Do you practice what you preach? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I when I counsel patients, I, I want to be able to give them, you know, my experience and and um, and honestly, having read so much of the literature, I just um, I just feel it's it's among many options is one of the better ones. Um, it's just kind of where I've landed. Um, I think we're just not active enough to be able to handle a lot of the nutrients we're exposed to. And so one way that I think we um, are able to compensate and stay healthy is actually to favor plants. And so that's sort of where I've, where I've landed personally. Yeah, and personally, yes, um, I'm also um, mostly whole foods as well. Um, and coming from an Indian background, I, I need my spice. So thank God spices are um, healthy. So, um, and it's, it's definitely been a journey talking to patients. Um, you, you better have some um, recipes and some breakfast options and some meal options um, available um, and have experience um, in cooking those things. And I enjoy cooking. So, um, uh, so yeah. Yeah, and I would say I've been plant-based for 10 and a half years now, um, except uh, there are uh, often on times where I've incorporated fish into my diet. Um, the level at which I eat whole foods has to do with my level of discipline, stress, and sleep. Um, in an ideal world, I'm whole, eating whole food plant-based, and uh, my uh, cardiometabolic risk factors and body fat and energy and sleep were just at, at their best at that time. Um, but uh, just like with my patients, when exposed to plant-based uh, processed foods, uh, I have a harder time under duress uh, saying no to them. Um, so that's a full disclosure on that, though my intention is always whole food plant-based. We do have another question coming in from Dr. A. Uh, what should we recommend to patients? And maybe a cor corollary of that is how do you guys decide what diet to recommend to them? Um, I can start. So, I mean, up front, I, I do um, tell them that there's sort of these two routes we can take. We can track calories and, and or we can sort of play with the macronutrients. And uh, most people, I have to say, favor the latter approach. There's not a whole lot of people who come in wanting to count calories. Um, and it's usually what I recommend. I think we know that long-term people who are, are sort of have to count calories, they end up stopping at some point and they gain weight. Um, and generally, I'm just, I'm always encouraging people to think about three things, um, whether they're making a few changes after the first visit or whether they're really, really going for it. And one is reducing processed foods, one is reducing fat, one is increasing fiber. So at any given visit, those are the, those are the things I'm, I'm talking about with them. Um, and I'm always sharing uh, lots of resources, but um, I am very interested in, uh, as I'm sure we all are, in being sort of very, very culturally appropriate. And so what people like to cook, where they're coming from, what their background is, that, that also plays into it as well. Um, and I'm always sharing recipes and, and um, you know, ideas in that way too. Yeah, so uh, when I cancel patients, it's, it's gonna be in a, in a similar vein. Um, uh, except a lot of my patients have come to me already having lost weight on low calorie uh, diets without regard to composition. Um, and so I do a lot of, of counseling on putting the good stuff back in as well. Um, for instance, the data suggests that just as, as Doug had pointed out, the, the US, um, sorry, was it the ADA or the USDA recommendations for fiber or 30, 30, 30 grams 30 per day, grams per day. Uh, the, which is probably about 
at best half of what what we used to eat, um, but the, the Americans eat about half of that. Um, and the data suggests that just getting back to the the recommended thirty grams of fiber a day is associated with about a pound of weight loss per week, right? So by adding the good stuff back in while also saying get rid of of uh, of the ultra processed foods, I mean that that's a starting point. I really um, over the last say 10, 11 years have moved away from uh, the calorie counting side. I do get maybe 10% of my patients just aren't interested. And then we, we go in the calorie counting route. Um, I, I have some pretty amazing success stories doing just that, but none of them kept the weight off unless they changed the quality of their food and ultimately incorporated, you know, seven to 10 hours a week minimum of exercise into the maintenance phase. There always has to be a uh, long-term strategy. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time, so I'll end the webinar here. Everyone, thank you again for your attendance. Dr. Rajkumar, Dr. Limber, Dr. Kane, thank you again as our guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.